Welcome to the Holistic Health Podcast, beautiful humans. If a professional, polished, well-edited podcast is what you're after, then move right on. If, however, you love unfiltered banter, unedited bloopers, authentic heart sharing, and a very generous dash of holistic health education, then you're in the right place. Let's dive in, shall we? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Holistic Health Podcast. Hi, Amy. How fun is saying the Holistic Health Podcast just rolls off the tongue, you know? Oh, it has such a great ring to it. And I, I'm, I'm already fizzing. It's so fun. It really is. And um, I feel like you came up with that name and we were both so surprised that it wasn't taken because how, like, it feels so obvious. Like, why would someone not call their podcast the Holistic Health Podcast? I know, I know. We just, we won the lottery, the name lottery. <laughs> we really did. It was just meant to be, meant to be. Love that for us. Well, today we are going to dive straight in because you will very quickly get to know that Amy and I love a good chat. Uh, and once we get started on speaking about a topic, we uh, find it difficult to, to keep it concise, but we're going to do our best. Uh, and we're also going to bring you um, lots of different episodes that kind of break more complex topics down into more easily digestible bite-sized pieces so that you can understand them and that so we don't end up having to create or make you listen to, you know, 90-minute, two-hour episodes because who has time for that kind of commitment when it comes to education about, you know, something like estrogen, which is what we're speaking about today. So with today's episode, we really wanted to dive in and chat a little bit more about how to actually lower estrogen. I feel that having high estrogen or estrogen dominance is something that is quite common. And I don't think it's very well understood. I think it's oversimplified a lot. And I also think there is a lot that you can do yourself um, you know, without even working with a practitioner. And then, of course, there's so much you can do when you're in the hands of a good practitioner as well. Mm -hmm. So where I thought I would start just to kind of set the scene a little bit is speak to some of the symptoms that you might experience if you have excess estrogen in your body or estrogen dominance and how or when to test for that, because that's always an important piece of the puzzle. So first things first, I wanted to share that this, you know, this conversation or primarily the way that I'm going to speak about it, particularly when I'm speaking to testing for it, I'm talking to people who are not on oral contraceptives because being or, or even on really any hormonal based contraceptive, because being on the pill, for example, essentially shuts down your own hormone production. So to simplify things a little bit, let's uh, just leave that one out of the equation. So some of the most common estrogen excess or estrogen dominant sim um, symptoms would be having really heavy periods, sore boobs, feeling really irritable pre-period, um, having an underactive thyroid, um, and also fibroids. So they're some of the first ones that I think of when I think of someone that has excess estrogen. You can also be someone who finds it difficult to lose weight, but I think that sometimes can, that's very layered because there's so many reasons for that as well. And there are certainly other reasons um, that you might have some of those symptoms that I just mentioned. But if you feel like you're ticking a number of those boxes, um, then that's when I'd certainly follow through with doing some more formal testing of your estrogen levels. So for me as a practitioner, um, when I'm when I'm thinking about measuring estrogen levels for someone, there's generally two points in someone's menstrual cycle where I'm interested to hear and see where those estrogen levels are at. So day two or three of your cycle is usually where I would start. So for context, day one of your cycle is the first full day of your period. So as an example, if you were, if it was 6 p.m. and you noticed that your period had started 
I would wait until the next day and that next day would be considered day one. So the first full day of bleeding, not spotting. So if you're someone who does get some spotting, um, which we'll talk about next episode, um, then that is not a period that is premenstrual spotting. So day two or three of your cycle or day two or three of your actual period. And this gives us what we call a baseline or basal measure of your estrogen levels. So we're looking at what do your estrogen levels look like when they are at their lowest, essentially. And for me, from an optimal perspective, I'm looking at your estrogen levels ideally being between 100 and 200 picomoles per liter. Now, there is, of course, as with everything, some individual variation in that um, because, you know, we always want to take into consideration your symptoms. And generally speaking, getting um, a few measures, as in measuring your hormones in a couple of your cycles or a few of your cycles is more reliable than a one-off kind of measure. And then the second point in time in which I would consider measuring someone's estrogen levels is in your luteal phase. So that is in in your second half of your cycle. And I'd usually be looking at measuring that about five to seven days post ovulation. Um, Or if you have very regular cycles, you can kind of count backwards by about a week and and measure it then. Um, And This is more so, I guess, a reflection of how well are you clearing your estrogen? And ideally, I am looking for that level to sit somewhere between about 300 and 500 picomoles per liter. And again, um, that is very much taken into consideration alongside symptoms. Um, And just be mindful that if you do accidentally test a bit too early, then you might actually end up seeing a much higher estrogen uh, amount than what you should. And that's where I think just having the help of a practitioner to interpret your results can be really powerful because otherwise you can kind of be led down a bit of a path that, um, yeah, you uh, you might not necessarily get accurate information from. The other thing I thought I would mention here is that it is a good idea to also take your luteal phase progesterone into consideration when you're looking at estrogen and progesterone balance or considering estrogen dominance. Um, We're going to speak a lot more in detail in another episode about progesterone, but I just wanted to mention that there and and that in your luteal phase, uh, we want to look for a a ratio of about 10 to 1 of estrogen to progesterone um, is is a rough good aim. But of course, as I said before, individual variations very slightly depending on what's going on for you symptomatically also matter. Um, what else did I want to say to that? Um, well, yes, the other layer to that before I hand it over to Amy to talk a little bit more about what could potentially drive having higher estrogen levels is just that, you know, we never, I mean, I never, and I know most practitioners would never just look at your estrogen levels or even your progesterone levels in isolation, because there are loads and loads of factors that, also tell a story when it comes to your hormones. So things like your FSH and LH, which are uh, messages from your brain to your ovaries. Um, Another thing that's important is your sex hormone binding globulin, which is one of the taxis that carries uh, your hormones around your body. Um, We also want to look at something like bilirubin, which is part of your liver function test, because that can influence how estrogen is cleared or not cleared from your body. So it's never enough to just look at one thing in isolation. Our, in case you haven't noticed, our hormones are complex. We are complex, magically complex, of course. But it means that when we are looking at uh, assessing what is happening in the body, it's it's never a one panel, one marker thing. It is what is the story that these results are telling me and do they match how I'm feeling from a symptom perspective? And I think that's where working with a practitioner that has lots of experience really shines. It's combining your own innate body intelligence and intuition and knowing what is 
you know, what you feel and sharing that with a practitioner and then allowing them to help you interpret what that might mean alongside doing some more kind of crude measurements, if that makes sense. Um, Amy, do you have anything to add to that before uh, we move on to perhaps why or how estrogen becomes high in our body? Yeah, so I think just to reiterate what you said in terms of testing, you can't really ever take one marker in isolation and go, this is fine or this is not fine. And so looking at how the interplay of all of those hormones makes a huge difference. And there's a couple of things that I will sometimes do as well in addition to the ones you mentioned. So um, when it comes to estrogen excess, I guess for people to be really clear about what that is, sometimes it's like an obtuse excess estrogen, but often it can be a relative issue with progesterone being insufficient, which is why this is part one of two. Yeah. I'm talking about lady business. Um, the other thing is as well is you can really get a sense for someone's cycle health by monitoring their um, saliva hormones through their whole cycle. So the two tests that I will sometimes do if I think it's important is a 28-day salivary profile. And what that actually does is it's actually taking a little snapshot every few days of women's estrogen and progesterone and how they relate to each other through the cycle. Um, so that's a really nice way of getting a deeper look as well, because sometimes it's fine in certain weeks and other weeks, you know, the, the body drops the ball for whatever reason. And then the other one is estrogen metabolites. And I know you're going to talk, I think you're going to talk about that. Maybe I'll talk about that. One of us um, will talk about it. <laughs> one of us will talk about it. But sometimes it's not that your body is producing too much estrogen. In fact, that's the least likely scenario ever um, or necessarily that you have too much on board, but your body has trouble eliminating it for some reason. So looking at the way in which the liver is clearing your estrogen can also give us some insights into not just your liver function, but nutrient status and your ability to clear your own hormones and maybe overall hormone load. Like just as a side note, I know we're not talking about testosterone today, but there is no direct um, metabolic pathway for the elimination of testosterone. It actually must first be converted into estrogen before it can be eliminated from the body. And so if your testosterone levels are raised for whatever reason, low SHBG, stress, um, ovarian or adrenal androgens being produced for whatever reason, you then end up with an excess of estrogen, not because you're making too much, but there's a bottleneck with uh, hormone elimination. Mm. Um, from there. So yeah, like I said just before, it's very rare that someone's body simply makes too much estrogen. It's usually there's some sort of secondary issue that has um, created an environment where estrogen levels have become elevated above what's healthy um, or, of course, progesterone can't oppose it, but that can happen from internal factors and external factors. So looking at external factors, I think to start with, this is probably one of the most common ones. It's becoming more and more prevalent because our environment is shifting. Things are becoming a lot more toxic. And most of us really operate from a point of view that if it was sold on the supermarket shelves or in shopping centres, it can't possibly be bad for me because they wouldn't let you buy it if it was. And I've got a little rude announcement <laughs> for anyone <laughs> listening. Um, and that is every country has different rules um, around endocrine disrupting chemicals. And let me tell you, Australia has the she'll be right rule, which means <laughs> there are no rules. Doesn't sound like Australia. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and basically it's a free for all. There are all kinds of carcinogenic cancer causing chemicals, endocrine disrupting chemicals in uh, building materials, furnishings, water, food, personal care products, cleaning products. I mean, the list goes on. So BPA free products too. Oh my gosh. I'm about to just get on my soapbox. About yeah, I know. I'm like, I can feel it. Can I'm, you like, hear? I'm like warming up. Unleash the beast. 
boxing gloves are on. So, so with hormone imbalances, I guess my point about all of that is, is yes, there's a lot you can do yourself to protect and preserve your hormones, but a lot of it is, is hashtag not your fault in that there are external influences that you're likely unaware of that are messing with you, messing with you. So let's run through a few. You've just mentioned one of the big ones, BPA. So BPA, B, the BP part stands for bisphenol. So BPA means bisphenol A. And it's a plasticizer that's used in all kinds of products, not just plastic products, but certainly plastics as well. And what it does is the higher the content, the more um, flexibility the plastic has. So I guess to give you a practical life example, a I don't want to say the brand name because I don't want to like drop anyone in it, but let's just say, you know, food storage containers um, that you might put your leftovers in, they are a harder plastic versus say, again, plastic wrap. <laughs> 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 Rhyme, rhymes with rhymes sad with crap. Sad rap. <laughs> Look, this is my first proper episode. I'm not. I'm trying not to get us in trouble. I'm, I'm trying to be on my best behaviour. I promise it won't last, but right now I'm finding my way. <laughs> so I think they're picking up what we're putting down. Yeah, yeah. And it's in really unexpected places too, like supermarket receipts and movie tickets. And mm. essentially, unfortunately, it actually is absorbed really quite well through the skin. And if you were to grab a supermarket receipt, the I looked at one study that shows you've absorbed half of the BPA it contains within one and a half seconds. Wow. So, you know, I always say no receipt or I get the cashier to put it in, in the bag for me. Um, and truly, I mean, I think it's quite criminal that they're handling that all the time. Mm. But here's the thing. Once people became aware of the issues of BPA or at least picked up along the way that it was hashtag bad, everyone started looking for BPA-free products and, of course, the market delivered. But the cold hard truth is they simply swapped one bisphenol for another. And so in removing BPA, they just replaced it with BPS or BPF. And some of those are even more estrogenic than BPA. So BPA free is BS in my book. And mm. so ultimately you want to really avoid plastics as much as humanly possible. Um, certainly don't put things in it that are hot. Don't reheat food in plastic um, if you can avoid it. Uh, and, and certainly trying to avoid, you know, picking up thermal receipts and things like that. There is one brand, one brand that I know that is plastic that has been tested for its endocrine disrupting uh, effects and has been shown to have no impact on hormones. Now, it's still my preference, like, for example, from a drinking bottle point of view, to recommend glass or stainless steel. Mm -hmm. But Triton, T-R-I-T-A-N, is the plastic that has been tested for those things and found so far, based on the tests that they've run, to be ticking all the boxes that we want it to be. Mm. So avoiding BPA is a really, really big one. Uh, another one is endocrine disrupting chemicals in personal care products um, and cleaning products. I mean, the closer the proximity the product has to you and entering your body, the more um, diligent you want to be about minimizing your exposure um you know I was a purist when I came out of college and got rid of every single thing but you know we have to live our lives and mm. we all have our vices but really if you're dealing with hormone issues before you even think about taking a supplement or a herb get rid of the external sources and the two biggest ones that I see um, time and time again are perfume and scented candles. Now, ultimately, when you make a list of what women use on their bodies every day, I read one article that said we apply something like 237 chemicals to ourselves every single day, which of course we're inhaling and absorbing. And in the case of the things we put on our lips, 
ingesting. You know, a woman can ingest her body weight in lip balm and lipstick in her lifetime. So when you think about what can be in those products, like lead, for example, Mm. that's a really serious health hazard. I know we've come a long way from the old days where women would put arsenic on their cheeks in Mm. (laughs) in place of blush. A little bit of, you know, a little bit of pep in their step. But ultimately, we're still really being significantly impacted health-wise by things that are bad for us. Now, going a little bit deeper, I also want to touch on things that we might consume orally. So in a perfect world, the only food that we would be able to buy slash eat would be organic because no one needs a serve of pesticides along with their vitamins and minerals. And the sad news about pesticides is the way they work is they disrupt and damage the sexual health of insects by messing up their hormones and rendering them infertile and having abnormal reproductive cycles. So pesticides are a real pest for hormones That being said, there are some that we want to be even more mindful of than others. And I think if you had to prioritize organic food, I would say leafy greens um, because you can't really wash off pesticides from leafy greens, whereas you could scrub it off, you know, a potato a little bit better or harder vegetables. Mm -hmm. The other part to that is chicken and eggs. So chicken and eggs would have to be the worst culprit for endocrine disrupting compounds. And that's because what they do is for a commercial um, broiler factory, which is what they call chicken farms, they want the chickens to grow up as big and as plump as quickly as possible so that they feed them less um, and get, get more money, make it more profitable. And what they actually do, even the ones that say hormone free, what they actually give them is something called an antibiotic growth promotant. And this is going to segue into mold toxins in a minute. But basically the work, the reason they can get away with saying they're hormone free is because they haven't given them something that is strictly classified as a hormone. But And this is where the trickery in labeling of food and personal care products comes in is certain chemicals can come under multiple labels. And just to give you an example that doesn't relate to food, um, I created a skincare range, you know, probably a decade ago now, longer, and it was labeled fragrance free. And it didn't have synthetic fragrances in it anyway, but some of the essential oils, which technically can be categorized as fragrance are also categorized as antioxidants. So on the paperwork, they were categorized as antioxidants as as a a way of keeping the product fresh when technically it's not really fragrance-free, is it? And the same thing happens with hormone-free chickens. No, they're not giving them hormones directly, but they're actually giving them antibiotics because caged farmed chickens eat off the same floor that they poop on so kill the bacteria but the antibiotic itself is a growth promotant that has a hormone effect to actually accelerate the growth of the chicken so if you are dealing with excess estrogen um, swapping to organic chicken and eggs um, if you eat those foods would be a top priority and then anything that gets sprayed a lot or you can't wash that well so things like berries and greens would be would be the way to go and then I guess that sort of leads me on to mycotoxins so I know I'm the new kid on the block here so I might explain to people like what the heck that is <laughs> And why we're all of a sudden talking about it. Yeah, Um, like, fuck, another thing to worry about. (laughs) So this one's going to be, this one's more of a thing that um, someone else would help you assess in your home. But I am planting the seed just so that I can raise awareness because this is particularly important um, for anyone dealing with hormone imbalances, especially if you're dealing with fertility issues is you might be doing everything perfectly, right? You've gotten rid of all endocrine disrupting chemicals in your food, water, personal care products, cleaning products, but there's actually something hidden in your home that's influencing your hormones. And mycotoxins are a form of biological toxin that mold produces. 
And the tricky thing about mold is mold is microscopic, meaning just because you can't see mold in your house doesn't mean you don't have mold in your house. Mm -hmm. And the mycotoxins that they produce can cause all kinds of health problems, but some of them are very strongly xenoestrogenic, meaning they are like a chemical match for our estrogen receptors and they're very, very strong. So it's almost like increasing your estrogen levels and the effect on your body is really amplified as well. So it can create this excess estrogen effect. So how you know if you've got mold in your home is really, I guess, another episode entirely. <laughs> um, but if you've ever had a leak, burst pipe, the bath's overflowed, the roof's leaked, um, a braided water hose is, you know, um, cracked, the kids overflowed the bubble bath, or you live in a humid environment or a wet environment, if you're not monitoring the humidity, keeping it dry and making sure wet parts of your interior of your home are dry within 48 hours, you almost certainly have a mold problem. So if, if you tick any of those boxes, then that is definitely an avenue you would want to investigate. Um, so that's are sort of the main external sources. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but they're probably the most obvious ones. Um, and I guess alcohol. Do you want to talk about alcohol or do you want me to talk about alcohol? Mm, no, go for it. Go for it while you're on a when, while oh, you're on a roll right. and then I'll <laughs> I'll filter into some other internal cool. problems. So alcohol, I guess, is I guess the crossover is it's an external thing that we internalize, right? We ingest yeah. it. And um, alcohol really impacts our ability to metabolize estrogen. Now, beer, beer as a particular type of alcohol also can have xenoestrogenic effects or phytoestrogenic effects because it is made with hops and hops is a um, plant that has got plant estrogen like compounds in it and so that's something else to be mindful of too but generally speaking the same detoxification pathways that metabolize estrogen also take care of alcohol and alcohol is a poison and so if your body had to choose has to choose between metabolizing alcohol and your estrogen it's just going to park your estrogen while it deals with the alcohol first and therefore your estrogen it's like you know the, the trash collectors can't get it all out in one go. And so they have to focus on the worst, smelliest, you know, bad trash and the other stuff has to kind of wait. And so the more you drink in one occasion, the more you'll be impacted, the more frequently you drink, the more you'll be impacted. And this is how some people can end up with excess estrogen because of alcohol consumption, especially if they're in a job that requires entertainment, things like that, or well, they're just super social butterflies. But if you are trying to get your estrogen under control, reducing that or eliminating it, depending on the situation, is going to be part and parcel of a holistic approach to doing that. Mm, yeah, that's such a big one, especially in, I think, our culture in Australia in particular, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's, there's problems everywhere, but I think that alcohol is very like socially normalized. And I, I think that once you, like, unless you have friends around you that are kind of on the same page or, you know, uh, open to not drinking and it's not just this thing where, it, you know, if you don't drink, it's a, you're being antisocial, you feel you're being antisocial. It can be really hard for people. And I know I have to remind myself of that often because I no longer really have a lot of circles or really any circles where alcohol is something that brings us together. It still might be there, but it's not the thing, whereas it very much was much more that way when I was younger. But I think that I'm I'm the more of the exception than the rule. And I think for people, when they first start out on that journey of decreasing alcohol or not having alcohol and going out and actually saying no, it can be quite triggering for people around them. And then that can make the person who's saying no 
a little bit more uncomfortable. I don't know if you've ever experienced that yourself, Amy, but I certainly have had my fair share of, oh, you're no fun or, you know, mm. those kind of comments where they're really not about me at all, but it's it's hard to be on the receiving end because we all want to belong or feel like we fit in. Totally. I, and I think I've been really lucky actually in that, you know, I've gone out when I've been on a detox and just drunk water and other people have been drinking it, it's fine, like it doesn't bother anyone, but I get how it can make other people feel uncomfortable and then they have to transfer that discomfort back onto you. Yeah. Um, and it is, I guess the other aspect to it is everyone wants affinity with the mm. people around them and wants to feel in alignment. And ultimately, if you let's say you're out for dinner and then you kick on somewhere else like you know and you're not drinking but the other people you're with are at some point there is a breakdown in the alignment (laughs) so (laughs) that is the best way I've ever heard of putting it I was gonna say yeah drunk people become so irritating at some point yeah well you know that's the other way you can put it you you just are no longer on the same page in terms of having a conversation the level Mm -hmm. of conversation shifts their level of uh, articulation slides south, and and it's no longer fun. It's no longer fun for you if you're if you're the one that's not having it. And I think you know that can make it challenging in itself. But yeah, like you said, so much of our culture is built on you know getting together for a meal and a drink, and mm. it can be strange for people who've never ever opted out of that momentarily or for longer periods of time to sort of wrap their heads around what that would be like. And so it's tricky. It's really tricky. Mm. Um, And certainly not like if you have a group that that's a really big part of your social culture, you are going to want to get support and maybe have some chats about that before you uh, go down that path just to make it easier for everyone, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. We could probably do a whole episode on Mm. how to say no to things that don't serve you in social situations. I like it. I'm going to put it on the list. (laughs) Love that. Love that. Well, I'm going to continue with the theme of, um, I guess, sources of uh, internal excess estrogen or estrogen dominance. And I won't cover every single possible thing that I can think of because it will there, will, there is quite a long list, but I wanted to touch on a few that I see quite commonly come up in a lot of my um, patients. So one would be, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit already, but is having low sex hormone binding globulin. So again, sex hormone binding globulin is basically like that taxi that carries estrogen and other hormones around the body. And if you don't have enough of it, What that means is that you essentially have a lot more passengers, aka estrogen, free out on the street and roaming. And when there's too many of them, it starts to become a problem. So we really want a nice level of sex hormone binding globulin where we've got you know, enough, but not too much. So it's as with everything in the land of hormones, it all comes down to having a balance and a few things that can, I guess, uh, cause you to have low sex hormone binding globulin and therefore a relative estrogen excess um, is certainly uh, having an underactive thyroid, being overweight, uh, having insulin resistance um, there and PCOS, and usually that's related to the insulin resistance that happens in uh, the large majority of PCOS types, but not all. Um, and they're just a couple of examples of, you know, why you might be experiencing a low sex hormone binding globulin. And you can certainly measure um, SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, on a blood test to get an idea as to whether that is happening for you. Um, there are also there are like SNPs, which are basically like genetic, uh, I guess, variations or differences that people can have to do with sex hormone binding production, um, and that can influence things to an extent. But I I think that 
by far the large majority of people with low sex hormone binding globulin in my experience, usually if we're able to correct those drivers, then um, that sex hormone binding globulin can come up a little bit um, and have a more of a protective role against a uh, high estrogen levels, for example. Another common thing I I see, and Amy, I know you would see this as well, um, especially because it relates so closely to things like mold, um, illness, and um, and SIRS, which I'm sure we'll talk about in another episode, is high histamine levels. Because this one is, I have, it's like the chicken or the egg when it comes to histamine and estrogen. So basically high estrogen can stimulate uh, mast cells and mast cells then make more histamine and more estrogen And then like high estrogen also can decrease Dow, which is one of the enzymes that helps us to clear or break down, I should say, estrogen, I'm sorry, histamine that's coming through uh, our system. And then also if you are if you have more histamine around because that enzyme is compromised, it can then stimulate your ovaries to make more estrogen. And then we're back to the beginning. So it's literally like this loop that people can get into. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's why it's really important to be having a real holistic look at what's going on for you as an individual, instead of it just being this really simple and tidy thing, which it's it's not when it's working well, it is, but when it's not, there are certainly a few things to consider. The next one I wanted to speak to is actually um, a problem that can happen when we are over converting um, androgens, which are more like our male dominant sex hormones. So testosterone is one example of that when we're over converting that to estrogen. Um, and that's done by a particular enzyme called aromatase. And it can get quite tricky, as you can imagine, because we're talking about a intricate hormonal system. But basically, some examples of, I guess, um, why someone might have that issue happening for them or in what conditions or presentations that might be a thing. Um, It is quite common in endometriosis, in um, fibroids, in certain breast and endometrial cancers. Um, And also having low zinc levels can contribute to that as well. From a, I guess, an assessment perspective, and again, this is certainly something that a practitioner would be in a better position to help you understand, but on on your blood test, what that can present as is having high estrogen but low androgens, so um, low male dominant, so to speak, sex hormone. So again, that's probably not something that you're just going to look at on your own blood test and be like, oh yeah, I see that. But it is something that your practitioner, when you're working with someone, would take into consideration to help kind of, um, I guess, un, um, unravel the puzzle a little bit. And then the two other things that I wanted to, or probably there's probably, yeah, probably two, I'll I'll keep it to two. Two other things I wanted to speak to um, is also you can certainly have issues with your estrogen receptors. So Amy um, spoke about receptors very briefly before, but receptors are like doorways where, um, you know, the key being estrogen and then the doorway being the receptor. And basically, um, you know, how many or how little phytoestrogens you have in your diet, for example, can also have an influence on um, your receptors and can also have an influence on your experience of how you respond to the estrogen that's in there. So as an example, um, there are quite a few different types of phytoestrogens. So one is called isoflavones and they are found in most commonly in things like soy, uh, lentils and beans and peas are also a source of that. There's also um, ligands, which are found in flax seeds and cashews and sesame seeds. And then there are also um, some herbs that are considered to be that way as well. So hops was one um, that you mentioned before and also red clover. Now, there's a a bit of a controversy around um, phytoestrogens and a bit of confusion around how they work. And I've certainly um, 
had to relearn this for myself. And I do think that there are differing opinions on this. But my understanding is that phytoestrogens do have the ability to an extent to be kind of modulating um, in terms of the healthier sources I've mentioned there. And what that means is basically they can help to give you what you need is is the easiest way to kind of um, speak to that. They certainly aren't magic, you know, in isolation, but they can actually be part of helping to modulate your estrogen receptors in a way. And the other thing is that your microbiome will also have an influence on how much benefit you get out of isoflavins that are found in phytoestrogen rich foods, because a diverse microbiome, as in having lots of different kinds of good bacteria, actually has been associated with higher isoflavone levels. So the, I mean, maybe we can, we probably need to do a whole episode on just debunking and understanding soy a little bit, because I, I think it, it good quality soy can work for some people, um, but I also think that it can not work for other people. And I think that the source and the amount that you get matters, but that's probably a, a rant for another day. And then the final thing I wanted to speak about, um, and then Amy, I might get you to talk about, I guess, liver detoxification and, and that side of things of, of estrogen mm -hmm. is poor gut health. So as I mentioned before, gut health, not only does it contribute to having a really healthy microbiome and diversity and having that benefit, but if you don't have, um, I guess, good uh, a good like good gut health even even as simple as if you're not having a well-formed daily bowel motion that feels complete a that means that your estrogen that would normally be broken down and carried out in your poo is left there to recirculate mm -hmm. and be reabsorbed and become a problem again on top of what is already just naturally being produced you know day in and day out the other thing is that um, in a lot of people that have certain gut conditions or imbalances or overgrowth, there can be an enzyme that um, is known as beta-glucuronidase, which can actually build up. And I always, when I think of beta-glucuronidase, as I do, because that's why I do my spare time, um, I think of beta-glucuronidase is, you know, like when you're holding hands with a friend, um, maybe you don't do it anymore, but anyway, holding hands with a friend and then like someone comes and like karate chops your hands apart. I think of beta-glucuronidase as that, um, you know, that friend that like comes and karate chops your hands apart and then you're kind of left to like recirculate and try and find each other again. So we don't want too much of that and having, yeah, not uh, not great gut health balance or having any kind of overgrowth um, or parasites, dysbiosis, et cetera, can certainly uh, lead to having more of that beta-glucuronidase and therefore it being harder for you to get any excess estrogen out of your body. So that is a very oversimplified way of explaining it. But Amy, do you want to speak a little bit more to, I guess, estrogen detoxification? Because there are certainly other things that come into play and influence that. And I know you alluded to it a little bit earlier, and I think it'd be good to round out that conversation. Yes, totally. So like with everything that our body doesn't want to remain inside it. So that could be, that could be actual toxins or in this case, our own metabolic waste. There's a production line uh, to get that from the inside of our body to the outside of our body. And depending on what you're looking at, that sort of track out can be a little bit different, but certainly for um, estrogen and hormones, so much of it is removed through the stool and the gut. So as you said, you need to be having a regular bowel motion every day. That's kind of the end of the production line. Um, having good gut flora to ensure that um, estrogen is not being deconjugated, and I'll explain what that is in a second, is also really, really key. Um, but if you've ever seen, I'm probably showing my age here, <laughs> <laughs> but for all you youngsters that are listening to the uh, to the podcast, if you Google Lucille Balls, um, there's a skit she does of a production line in a chocolate factory. And 
there's a little conveyor belt where the chocolates are coming down. And I think if my memory serves me right, she's got to like wrap them in the wrapper and then put them back on the conveyor belt. And at some point the conveyor belt starts to speed up and she starts losing control and like can't wrap everything in time. And then she sort of starts throwing things onto the floor and stuffing it in her bra and into her mouth and into her hat. And it like, it gets really hectic. <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> So when we're thinking about toxins leaving our body, there's a conveyor belt. In fact, there's multiple conveyor belts. So there's the conveyor belt um, into phase, well, the phase one conveyor belt, the phase two conveyor belt, and then the phase three conveyor belt. And then the last conveyor belt is literally pooping it out or peeing it out. So first of all, we want all of those conveyor belts to be moving at the same speed. And this is where often a lot of people come unstuck, metabolically speaking, because if you increase phase one, which is the toxins, or in this case, the estrogen coming into the liver, and it's coming in faster than phase two can move it along, you're going to start to get a buildup in the liver and you're going to have other problems there as well. So one of the aims as a clinician is always to get phase one, two, and three moving nicely. And it always starts with, let's call it phase four. There's not really an official phase four, but that we're going to call that the bowel motion. Um, That starts Mm. with sort of unplugging the bottom end, literally and figuratively. (laughs) (laughs) And then you work your way up, you work your way up backwards. Um, I'm glad you also touched on gut health. I know I haven't got to the meat and potatoes yet, but um, If you have a compromised gut, first of all, you can't clear histamine that well, which will drive up estrogen. Mm -hmm. But the liver is aware if the gut is struggling and will withhold toxins where it can to avoid dumping them into a compromised tissue. And so it's also really important, you know, that if you have poor gut health, you're going to end up with poor liver health and you're going to end up with a backlog of biotoxins, biological toxins, whether they are exogenous or endogenously produced because the liver is waiting for the gut to heal before it releases the toxins down into the pipes. So, you know, there's a lot to sort of, (laughs) to the pipes, (laughs) to the (laughs) S-bend. Oh my gosh, I'm just picturing like being an orchestra of like phase one and phase two. (laughs) It honestly is the most beautiful symphony. And like you said before, when it works well, man, it is just a magical thing to to bear witness to on paper. Obviously, we can't dive into (laughs) our organs, but like it's really something pretty special, but it really, it can be dysregulated quite easily as well. Mm. So here, this is exactly why like when people have skin problems or hormone problems, they should never jump to, oh, I need to look at my liver. Mm. There are things below that and above that that are probably more important to consider uh, because most likely there's nothing inherently wrong with your liver. It's just overloaded from the top end or blocked up at the bottom end or both. And so that, of course, is going to form part of the part of the protocol. That being said, once you've got yourself, your, your practitioner has got you having regular, complete and healthy bowel motions, excellent. Part of that is hydration. And the way we get rid of toxins is water-based, by the way, and I'll explain how that happens in phase two in a second. But what that also means is if you're even fractionally dehydrated, your ability to detoxify the things you don't want in your body get compromised. Urine output goes down, bile output goes down, um, even sort of water vapor on the breath and sweat to other avenues of elimination are compromised because you don't have enough of this dilutant, if you want, for want of a better word, for your body to use it to eliminate. So drinking enough water, pooing regularly, and of course, dealing with any gut inflammation are kind of the first steps. Then we get to go and have a little chat with the liver and have a little look at where those conveyor belts are operating. Are they too slow, too fast? Are they working in harmony? Or is there a bit of a mismatch with the speed at which they are flowing? So with toxins, they're either water-soluble or fat-soluble. And this is probably a little bit nerdy, but if they're water-soluble, you can just pee and poo them out straight away. They don't have to undergo 
um, a transformation process to make them water soluble. But hormones, along with many other things that we want to eliminate, are actually fat soluble. So the first phase is actually converting them from a fat soluble compound into a water soluble compound. And that happens in phase one. And there are lots of things you can do to upregulate phase one, which you don't want to do until phase two is working well. But one of the big things I always tell my clients to do is have two or three servings of cruciferous vegetables a day, because this particular class of vegetable contains a compound in it that helps to speed up that um, transformation of estrogen into a water soluble form. So that includes things like broccoli, kale, not a fan of kale, but if you are, obviously go for it. Um, <clears throat> radishes, excuse me, <clears throat> cauliflower, cabbage, rocket, like there's a whole heap of them, really easy to get and include in your day-to-day -day diet. Um, even things like green tea, rosemary, spices like turmeric can be really helpful. Um, and of course, supporting optimal thyroid function is another really important part of having phase one work well. That being said, phase one's job is to convert um, the things we want to eliminate from fat soluble to water soluble. And then phase two is where the hand holding happens and it gets coupled up with another compound so that the body can easily excrete it. And that's called the conjugation phase. And there's multiple different pathways for conjugation. So one of them that estrogen is, is utilize, utilizes um, metabolizing estrogen is glucuronidation. And this is where um, calcium deglucurate as a supplement can be really helpful. Also kombucha is a really great source of um, glucuronide um, compounds that being said, kombucha is also high in histamine. So if you've got histamine problems, then you can't go there. So hence Simples. why. I know, so, so basic and so easy. You don't need so to. So you guys all to. good now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need to see a practitioner at all. <laughs> but this is why it's so confusing, I think, without the deeper understanding. You'll see like a magazine article, fermented foods are good for your gut and good for your skin. And then you'll see an article, oh, you know, kimchi made my acne twice as worse <laughs> well which is it kimchi. <laughs> I just felt it's like a damn kimchi man kimchi <laughs> <laughs> that stuff <laughs> so it's like it's really difficult and this is why prescriptions always have to be individual and you've got to look at the whole picture instead of um, a reductionist approach, which is, of course, more convenient, but far less effective. Mm -hmm. So phase two, there are a number of ways the body can approach eliminating estrogen, but one of the primary enzymes that converts estrogen into a form that we can eliminate is called COMPT. Now, I'll explain why you need to understand COMPT uh, shortly but it is the enzyme that's responsible for methylating estrogen so that the body can ultimately get it out of your body. Now, there's three different pathways for estrogen elimination. I reckon we can do another episode on estrogen metabolism, um, <laughs> but there's one pathway. Here's how I want you to think about it. If you've ever been on a hydra slide or you've seen a picture of one, you climb a really tall set of stairs and there might be one slide or there might be multiple slides. When it, it comes like to a water slide, yeah, a hydra, yeah, water slide, water slide, <laughs> water slide and a hydra slide, tomato, tomato, man. <laughs> Hello? It's like, it's, what is hydra slide? I'm okay, like, water slide. I'm, I'm like, I want to go on a hydra slide. Oh, yeah, you do. I yeah, have been do. on a water slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, water slide. Sorry, no guys. one needs to worry about me. Don't send help. It's all good. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> All right, water slide for Back those playing out. along at home. <laughs> so your estrogen, you're at the top of the slide and you've got three shoots to choose from, okay? You can go down the number two shoot, the number four shoot, or the number 16 shoot. Now, the best shoot to get estrogen out quickly, like the super fast slide, is the number two shoot. That's the one we really want to be pumping estrogen out. Okay. But for lots of reasons, we can, they can end up in a skinnier, longer, more convoluted tube. Do you like where I'm going with this analogy? <laughs> yeah, I really <laughs> love this. Down the four or the 16. And they're not so good. They're, they're not great for estrogen elimination. 
So there are ways you can sort of preferentially drive things down the two pathway, but one of them is to make sure comp is working well. Now, to get just super nerdy for a moment, um, comp, which is spelt C-O-M-T, is an acronym for catechol omethyl transferase, which is simply the name of an enzyme that transfers a methyl group or conjugates it, attaches it to um, whatever it's trying to get rid of. So in this case, COMPT tacks on a methyl group to the estrogen so we can push it out of the body. Now, COMPT actually clears um, a number of other things, including catecholamines, so our stress hormones like adrenaline and noradrenaline. So this is one of the many ways that stress can impact hormones. There are other ways, but if you're overburdening comp to try and get rid of adrenaline because you're not managing your stress, then it's not going to be able to clear estrogen as appropriately. The other thing is comp runs on magnesium. So a little bit like your car needs fuel to go, comp needs magnesium to work. And so this is stress depletes magnesium because it literally causes COMPT to burn through it a lot more quickly. Um, but certainly if you're not, if you don't have a magnesium rich diet and you're stressed and you're not managing your stress daily and you're stressed, you're not getting enough sleep um, or you're consuming things that are going to add to your <clears throat> adrenaline rush like coffee for instance or energy drinks you're going to compromise your ability to clear estrogen properly so you've really got to support comp as much as humanly possible and that includes magnesium um, supporting magnesium status and there are other foods like egg yolk bone broth leafy greens pasture raised meats and uh, organ organ meats that can be really helpful there too so Estrogen's come in, it's in phase one's converted it from a fat soluble to a water soluble. And then in phase two, it's gone from just being a water soluble thing to be coupled up with a mate, in this case, a methyl group to be eliminated through the bile or the urine, which is phase three. So phase three is where the body is actually actively beginning to push it out of the cells. And certainly with the liver, this is where bile stimulation comes from. So for anyone not familiar with their anatomy, you've got obviously the liver sitting sort of in the middle of your torso on the right-hand side and sitting at the back is like a little bag called the gallbladder, which is where bile will concentrate. Now, there are lots of things you can do to stimulate bile to be released from the gallbladder, which comes through to the bowel. It's, it, the bile is the thing that makes your poo brown. Mm -hmm. And by stimulating the gallbladder and allowing it to release bile, you're actually really encouraging that detoxification process. And there are a couple of things that stimulate it. Fats stimulate it because there are compounds in bile that help um, metabolize fat, break it down. Um, so if you're on a low fat diet, just know that you want to be stimulating your gallbladder in another way. And that is using bitters. So anything that tastes bitter on the tongue will actually cause the gallbladder to contract. And you can even stimulate the gallbladder with bitter um, herbs and, and nutrients in a capsule form. You don't necessarily have to taste them. There are bitter receptors lower down in the gut as well, but that's the most effective way. So whether that's lemon juice and water before meals or literally using bitter herbs like gentian on the tongue or bitter foods. I know from an evolutionary point of view, humans are really wired to like sweet things and avoid bitter things. And that's in part because bitter foods um, can sometimes be poisonous. And so if it tastes bad, we don't eat it. But there are helpful bitter foods. And, and unfortunately, because a lot of people have cut those things out of their diet because they're not as nice as sweet things, we're really lacking that, that bitter stimulation as well. So um, certainly that is another really helpful way to move the gallbladder and move the bile out, which then allows it to get out of your body if you're doing a good poo every day. Mm, love myself a good poo every day. <laughs> yes. Euphoria. It's the reward at the end of your liver detoxification. <laughs> should be an ad. I don't think that I should get into advertising though, evidently. <laughs> um, I loved all of that. I think that's so 
helpful. And I get that some, like some people, you may have to go back and listen to that a couple of times before you get it because it is very complex and we're doing our best to kind of break it down a little bit for you, but also to highlight that like A, your body is amazing because most of the time, if you give it the resources it needs, it Mm. will do this without you even Mm. thinking about it. Mm. And then B, when you do feel like something is out of balance, that's, it's certainly where, you know, investing in help for a short period of time to course correct is really beneficial because often we can get to that solution much faster. I mean, I'm so all for like DIY stuffing where you can. And I think a lot of the tips we've given you today, you certainly can do a lot of those yourself, particularly starting with just decreasing your, you know, your exposure to excess estrogen and drinking enough water and eating an anti-inflammatory diet and, you know, looking into magnesium supplementation. They're all very simple things, but there are certainly circumstances where getting someone to who really understands this stuff to just dig a little bit deeper um, can be really helpful. The other last couple of things that we wanted to touch on um, was diet and also supplementation. And we won't go into too much detail just because we've already mentioned quite a number of things so far. Um, and also because, as you can imagine, the tool that's going to do the job depends on what is actually broken down in any number of those pathways or areas. So what I thought is I'll just mention or reiterate a few things from a dietary perspective. So I think adequate fiber um, is really important. And to add to that, like fiber just being something that can also be a source of binding those excess estrogens and helping to have them uh, be removed from the body via, via a bowel motion, as an example. In saying that, and I always say this to people when I'm speaking, I think just because I've worked in gut health for so long as well, is that if you feel at, like absolute shit when you increase your your fiber, no pun intended, make sure that you don't just keep eating it because we've said it's good for you. Work mm-hmm. with someone to find out, well, why do I have such a problem, you know, utilizing fiber? Why do I feel so bloated or gassy or why does it have the opposite effect to what these people are telling me it should have in terms of, you know, it should improve my bowel motions because that can be an indication that there might be some kind of bacterial overgrowth or imbalance that's happening there. Um, and you have to actually address that first before you can kind of move on to the next phase of getting everything working together. Mm. Um, cruciferous vegetables, as Amy mentioned before, um, are great. The only caveat to that I would say is if you're someone who you know that you have an iodine deficiency or you have an underactive thyroid and you haven't yet checked to see if you have an iodine deficiency, A, check your iodine levels um, first. And if they are low, then um, you know you want the help of a practitioner to get those up because if you are, if you have a thyroid condition, and low iodine, sometimes you need to be a bit careful just about how um, how you go about correcting that. Um, but the reason I say that is because if you are iodine deficient, then when you eat too many cruciferous vegetables that contain a compound, compounds known as goitrogens, it can inhibit the uptake of iodine into your thyroid, which prevents you from making enough thyroid hormones. Now, that it is not a problem when you have adequate iodine levels. That's a myth. I do not believe that every single person with a with an underactive thyroid needs to avoid cruciferous or goitrogenic vegetables. It's the people who are iodine deficient that often need to do that temporarily to allow that iodine to become replete. And then you'll be able to get back to uh, eating more cruciferous vegetables um, or goitrogenic vegetables without the detriment. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing to just kind of throw in there is that uh, all these environmental toxins that we've been talking about also can act as goitrogens and inhibit the uptake of iodine into your thyroid. So although we're not talking specifically about thyroid today, I wanted to mention that because, you know, it's very easy to just think, oh, you know, it's all good. Like I just you know, I can still have, you know, bits and pieces of these endocrine disrupting chemicals around me. But it's my belief now that 
We have so many great options for natural alternatives when it comes to personal care um, Mm -hmm. and also storage of our food, et cetera. And there's there's so many things that we actually can't control. And so in terms of, you know, environmental toxin exposure, like we can't just stop, you know, wherever we live in our world, we can't just stop all the cars driving and, and emitting petrol fumes. Like we can't, there's certain things that we just cannot influence in our immediate environment to an extent. And that's where I think now more than ever, as that load of what we're exposed to increases, now more than ever, it's important to take control of what you can take control of. So that's my view on it. Um, I guess seeing a lot of increasing issues with thyroid function directly from in you know environmental toxins, I really think that um, I used to be a little bit more um, flexible with it with clients. And now I'm just like, put on my big girl pants. And I'm like, no, come on, we can do this. We can get rid of those bits and pieces that are just staying in there. Um, and it's just about finding a good alternative. Anyway, mm. I digress. The other thing I wanted to mention or just reiterate is exactly what Amy said around, um, you know, having adequate sources of things like magnesium, zinc, B vitamins, which um, are most rich, in my opinion, in good quality animal-based foods. I think that sometimes it can be rather difficult to get enough of those in a purely plant-based diet for most people when you're not supplementing that Mm -hmm. intake as well, because there's a layer of the fact that they are naturally lower in those uh, minerals in particular, Mm -hmm. but then also that uh, plant-based diets tend to be much higher in in fiber and uh, certain compounds that are in plant foods that can, um, I guess, inhibit the uptake of some of those minerals. So it's kind of like trying to find the balance. And of course, there's individual variation um, in that, but I would say just being really mindful of getting enough of those nutrients. And then, yeah, avoiding alcohol or limiting it as much as possible and drinking enough water Um, and then just addressing any individual food intolerances that you might have because anything that is that you're intolerant to is contributing to inflammation and, and dysbiosis and that's going to contribute to problems in all sorts of areas including some of those detoxification pathways as well so I think that's what I'd say on on diet. What about supplementation, Amy? We kind of we can't, we gave a few suggestions, but any mm-hmm. kind of extra bits and pieces that you'd like to throw in there, just as potential things that may help, depending on what's causing someone's um, excess estrogen or estrogen dominance, I should say. Yes, you t- uh, touched on inflammation. So obviously an anti-inflammatory diet would be important and you can look to sort of lower inflammation generally with uh, something like fish oil, EPA or icosapentaenoic acid is really good for that because inflammation will drive up aromatase, which of course increases the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. Um, so the other things that can influence aromatase are low vitamin D, which of course is more common during winter time, but also low vitamin A, low zinc, uh, again, two nutrients, as you mentioned, very difficult to get in a plant, a plant, wholly plant-based diet, I should say. Um, and yeah, that probably, I think you probably covered most of them. The other one that I think would be fairly safe for people to, Um, consider is milk thistle. Milk thistle is a liver herb that helps to protect the uh, the liver. It helps to regenerate the liver and it helps to recouple phase one and two and three um, to work in sync with each other. So many of the other liver herbs might upregulate or downregulate phase one or two, not something you want to be fiddling around with yourself. Uh, but milk thistle has sort of a bit of a balancing and protective um, supporting role there. And yeah, as you said, fiber, water, um, and removing those external things would be the big places to start. Mm, and do some sweating, do some exercise. Yes. yes. <laughs> Love all of those. Well, I think we shall wrap up our chat on estrogen there. I think that's plenty for people to digest, assimilate and (laughs) get rid of. Um, And we will come back to you guys next week with an episode on 
the progesterone side of the story because I think that that is we absolutely cannot consider estrogen without its buddy progesterone. And I think that conversation will make even more sense um, when we add to that. So Amy, thank you for joining me as well. And I will see you next week.